another exciting Houdini tutorial. Today I will be showing you how to deep dive with Copernicus, look into texture workflows, how to create mesh maps, similar as you would do in Substance Painter, how to utilize them, how to get them into Copernicus and how to actually make some cool looking materials and textures. This will be showing the basic principles of everything so you will need to build up on that to create more advanced materials but I'm pretty sure I will create more um, tutorials using the same workflows. Feel free to check out my Patreon where I'm uploading all the scene files for all my previous tutorials. Now let's get going and deep dive into Houdini and check out the Copernicus texture workflow. Alright, we are back in Houdini and following my previous tutorial I am working in Solaris and as you can see in my render view we have a live render going using XPU, using denoising, using depth of field, using lens shaders and now also using all of the nice uh, COP networks to create some really cool texture work to make everything look really realistic. We will be deep diving into this. Again, this will be a kind of walkthrough. I will be explaining my thought processes and everything. And again, you will have access to the scene files if you are supporting me on my Patreon. You can see this is heavily interactive. It's a really realistic shader, I feel, looking really nice. And now let's just probably just deep dive into it, go back to the Vulcan viewer. And this is now my viewport. What should we do? Frame it properly, frame one, something like this. And then we can just rotate. And you can see the viewer is representative of the render, just the metallic is somehow not really working as I would expect it to. All right, so the idea is, at least for this video, I was trying obviously the new Copernicus nodes and I was trying to eliminate the need to use texturing tools. So similar as what you could have done within the shader, like extracting curvature or occlusion, I'm kind of based off that creating textures and creating this on the fly in Copernicus and then reading those textures right onto the shader. And I will definitely go into detail now what it's all about. But first, there is a little bit of prep work that needs to be done in order for this to work, obviously. Let me show you quickly how the COP network looks like. It's nothing crazy. I just try to keep it very simple for you guys to grasp the concept and how I'm approaching things. And obviously, there can be way more complications going into this. But I feel this shows most of the technical aspects of it and then we can just go into the details. So all of this will be explained. These three steps are very important to get the data maps that you probably would know from Substance, data designer or painters, the big curvature and all of that. So as I said, there's some prep work that needs to be done. Initially, I just bring in the Dragon asset. It's just a scan data. Very ugly, lots of points, not a good match, really no UVs. So I'm just uh, transforming this into kind of smaller scale, 10, 15 centimeters or so, very small, and then cleaning it up, doing a poly reduce and an auto UV. You can see it's kind of red here, which means it's frozen, which means this step is baked into the scene file and it's not re-cooking the scene up to this point because the auto UV takes a little bit of time to create a more or less good UV layout. You can see the islands are pretty big. There's not as much stretching going on. And you kind of need UVs in order to do all the data maps in COPS. And then again, I'm doing a COP LOD. And this is used to display the custom geo within COPS. And I'll show you how to bring that in. What I'm just doing, I'm really reducing the poly count, but keeping the UVs. You can see we've got 11,000 points here. And then it's just out LOD. It's just a null that I know what to grab. And then on the right or in the middle, actually, I'm creating ambient occlusion, I'm creating a dirt kind of thing and a curvature. And the settings are pretty basic. It's the lab's physical ambient occlusion. Let me see how quick that goes. Visualize it, AO. And you can see if I disable the UVs, this is my occlusion mapping. I played with the settings until I was kind of satisfied. They might not really look like occlusion, but I think it gives a really nice detail on the geo. A similar thing with the second occlusion, which is for dirt, which is kind of just a collection of grime. Very similar, actually. The last one is a curvature, which has concavity and convexity. It's essentially the valleys and the ridges, I guess. So it's kind of whatever you want to do in the shader. So these four maps are baked as point data onto each point. Then I am reading that into COPS to do some things. 
And on the right hand side, this is my render geo, which I just cleaned up, deleted everything except UVs. And then this is output to the stage, which is this guy. So this is my high res geo. Then below here, as usual, I have a little turntable thing. This is now very simple. It's just rotating 360 degrees over my time range, nothing specific. The only thing, if I wanted to get motion blur for some reason, the only way to do it was to set this to sample frame range. It actually did calculate motion blur properly. And then using the new lob nodes, quick surface material, which is kind of a standard surface shader. And what is new here for you is that I'm actually using this OP colon stage texturing base color. This is pointing to a node within my texturing network. And it's important that it's OP colon and no space in between. It's essentially reading them on the fly. So you can see I've got one, two, three, four maps that are driving the look of this. Now let's have a look. You can see these are now the maps being uh, working properly in the viewer. Pretty nice. And now I think it's time for the quick deep dive into COPS, what we are actually doing. So let me move this over and you can see now we've got the low res geo here and it's quite easy. You could just do a sub import. You can use an external sub and then it asks you which, which path you want to pull in. And then under stage dragon sub nah, create, I've got my out LOD. And now if I pipe this into my geo and the preview material, this is then the material I'm using. So if I wanted to load in the high, high res geo, I could just go to uh, our geo. It will take probably a little bit longer to load, but this is now the high detail mesh within COPS. It's better to use low res to have faster iteration times. So that's kind of the end of the network. So the, the beginning is very similar as before. We now pulling, using a sub input again, pulling in the geo, but this time using the data stream. Data stream consists of all the data points, which we can easily pull in here. It's very important to use the rasterized setup and set this to UVs. That way, the data that you want to sample is laid out into the UV space of the geo like this. The result goes back into the rasterized geometry. And if you visualize this node now, you can see we have alpha, dirt, AO, and you can pick them. If you click the bottom right corner here, you can actually visualize them as well, uh, like so. How did I create them? You essentially just click a plus. You just type in the point attribute in here, and then it creates you a new point. You can set the signature. It's uh, working for you like that. Pretty easy. And I did that for all of these. And there's also presets. If you want to pick something specific, like normal position UVs, they are predefined. Basically, just the usual work that you do in Substance Painter or Designer. So let's say, let's walk through the base color process, which looks like this. Initially, we just convert mono to RGB, which is essentially single channel to an RGB. So you can remap black and whites to a color. I just tried different colors uh, on the fly. What you can also do, go up a level and then you can kind of pin this if you feel like it. Then you can make the changes on the fly and see it in the viewer, which is quite nice. But you then don't get the, well, you could probably do a split view. So if I would do another, let's say, I always mix it up top and bottom. We unpin this guy. There you go. So now you've got the top one in stage and the bottom one in cops. So now you have actually best of both worlds. Spacebar 3 does a uh, orthographic viewport. So now I think we're cooking. All right, so HSV adjust if you want to change the hue, whatever. And the first thing now is I, I created this uh, Brighton Curves. It's just a multiply constant technically, which expects a mask. And then you can just make things brighter or less bright based on a mask. And the mask that I'm pulling in is actually the curvature. So if I look at this, my data inputs, pulling in them from convexity or concavity, and then based on that, I am driving the sprite and curves. And beforehand, what I'm doing, I'm just creating a basic noise. And the interesting thing is I'm the position, I'm pulling it from the UV data. So it's kind of locked to my UVs and it's, it won't float if it's rotating and stuff like that. So just a noise texture, I'm remapping it. So it's more contrast technically. I'm using this to multiply it with the curvature to add some breakup. If you can see before and after, you will notice that it just adds a more organic breakup to the curvature. And then that's, as I said, is just going into the mask here to create these brighter spots. Very similar thing. I'm using the remap, the fractal noise to create some kind of dust color, some little wider speckles, and then some red, potentially some rust or some residual paint or something. The very same approach I'm using over and then with a mask 
I'm blending it in into the dirt AOV that we created in the sub section using the mask blending it over. Then another override for metalness. And that again is extracted from the, let's see, what, what source is it? From curvature. So I'm using that to drive the curvature itself. Based on that, I'm doing desaturation. You can see this is what I'm doing. You can obviously change whatever you need based on these inputs. I'm just clamping it to be safe. It's in zero and one range. Metalness then is a kind of a try to be as binary as possible that goes into the metalness parameter in the shader. Similar things to the roughness. I'm just using the curvature again with a dirt based on that. I'm just adding them together. So whatever is dirty is way more rough than concave surfaces going into roughness. For the bump mapping, I just played a little. I tried to get this little bumpy texture. It's maybe a little bit apparent once we actually do render it. Let's see. You can kind of see it here at the bottom, the little patterns on here. This is kind of coming from the this little bump map that I'm trying to do. Disable motion blur. There you go. Now it's kind of obvious what's going on. And then it's not on the metal areas and it's not on the dust sections. That's kind of the idea. Shift R goes to the previous view. And now how did I create this? Also pretty straightforward, similar as before, creating a woolly noise. This is now what I said is this weird pattern based on UVs. Then I'm adjusting it, essentially the value of locations that I don't want to have this on. And this is essentially the metalness. Metal pieces should not have this little bumpy texture. Then I'm extracting a single channel from this to create a luminous like single channel, essentially a float. And then I'm just mixing it together with some noise that I created down below. This is just that the metal areas are have a little bit of a different response to it. Then mixing them together, as I said, remapping them with another mask so the dust also gets rid of the bumpy texture. And then it's quite simple, height to normal, which just converts essentially a X and Y to XYZ map, and then that's normal. That goes into the normal shader for the preview section. And you can see these nulls are red with a specific simple name. And these, as I said before, are piping straight into the quick surface material. They are going right into OP stage metalness, base color, roughness. So it's pretty straightforward. Here I just have very simple lighting. So in the lights here, I've got a dome light and a rec light. So if you would uh, render from here, you can visualize obviously the lights, play with them if you need to. Let's bring back my tree viewer here. And then we can quite easily, if I look through my camera, where's the camera down below. Then we can place lights if we need to. So if you'd enter and go to maybe the fuse, you can then quite easily just click where you want the lights to go. So you have lots of control. You can obviously change the brightness, the intensity, however you see fit, you can play specular. So it's super fun, I feel, to work in, in Solaris because you have all these nice viewport optimizations and viewport handles to make things look good pretty quick. Um, yeah, then it's just the basic stuff. Uh, the lens material is the new lop node where you can apply kind of aberration right into the render. You can now see that my edges are really getting distorted, stuff like that. Uh, it's a bit slower. You would do that under the camera, under karma, you would enable lens shader, pipe in the material, pretty easy stuff. At the bottom, I explained that in my previous tutorial. Uh, this just goes over the export process and how to actually render with the USD render ROP. Then there's my little very basic comp setup that reads in the render from disk, does a little bit of glow. So this is kind of how I created the final images, A over B. So that's just a constant channel join ramps, basic stuff, Sapphire tools. And then, yeah, I have my glow. You can now see this is then updating. And I'm just using a ROP image to cache everything out to disk. And then I have my little deadline set up here to render that out. And as I said, if you want to have the scene files, they are on my Patreon. I always appreciate the support. Source file material tier will give you access to all my tutorial scene files ever uploaded. Probably around 100 scene files at the moment. 
or you can go to the Patreon shop and just get a one-off scene file for this specific one. Anyways, thank you so much. I hope you did like the end result. I hope this gives you some insights on what you can do with cops and Houdini. It's quite powerful. I'm really loving it. I will be doing more stuff and see you soon. Thank you.